Good day, dear doctors, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to relay my congratulations to the Vietnam Respiratory Society for coming up with this very engaging program virtually delivered for 2021. Secondly, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting the Asia Fungal Working Group to deliver this session, which I have been tasked and is entitled Fungal Infection Management in the COVID-19 Pandemic. This is an individually developed talk, although I am a member of the advisory group of Pfizer Philippines for Antifungals. The objectives for this talk are to concisely discuss the current data on patient risk factors and clinical presentation of invasive fungal infections that we see among our COVID-19 patients, namely aspergillosis, mucormycosis, and candidiasis, and to be able to discuss the diagnostic and recommended therapy of these infections based on the best available evidence and guideline recommendations. Let me begin with CAPA or COVID-19-associated pulmonary aspergillosis, the main reference of which is the guidance from the ECMM and ISHAM. This is a good example of collated data of global CAPA epidemiology this came from 17 countries from the literature and the fungiscope registry that captured 186 kappa patients. Majority were males with a median age of 68 years old. The most common treatment were triazoles, notably voriconazole, and the mortality rate was quite high at 52.2%. Let me kick off the kappa discussion with pathophysiology. What and how does IPA or invasive pulmonary aspergillosis happen? As in any viral infection, there is a consequent direct damage to the airway epithelium and this enables aspergillus for tissue invasion. Furthermore, there is hampered ciliary clearance in viral infections and this leads to either local or systemic immune dysfunction. Particularly in COVID-19, the extent of dysregulation associated with ERDS is not yet fully understood, but some have developed pronounced immunosuppression. In fact, there is a distinctive immune cell event of a decreasing T-cell populations, especially seen in severe COVID, and this decline of lymphocyte counts may occur with or without defective function. Notably, severe lymphopenia has been an established factor for predicting the risk of IFI in patients with hematologic malignancies. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in general usually occurs in people who are already sick from other medical conditions, so it can really be difficult to know which symptoms are related to PA. The symptoms are also nonspecific and can include fever, cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, and hemoptysis. In fact, other symptoms can develop if the infection spreads from the lungs to other parts of the body. Clinicians should therefore consider the possibility of kappa, especially in patients with severe COVID-19, if there is worsening respiratory function or sepsis, even if the patients do not have the classic risk factors for IPA. Aside from kappa, we also have a distinct entity called the influenza-associated PA. And the similarities between the two are that they can be of high prevalence, although underreported, and there may be an absence of classic host factors for the patients who are infected, with similar timing in disease diagnosis after ICU admission, and the presence, once again, of lymphopenia. However, in kappa, it isn't clear whether SARS-CoV-2 infection itself is the main risk factor or if risk factors such as steroid therapy further increases the risk for disease progression. Having said that clinical manifestations are not specific for PAPA, how about radiologic imaging? Unfortunately, radiology alone is not sufficient to define CAPA patients. However, the findings of multiple pulmonary nodules or lung cavitation should trigger further work up. How about the halo sign, which you see in your picture? Does it clinch the diagnosis of kappa? The answer is no, and this is because the halo sign suggests local infarction, and we do know that an intrinsic part of severe COVID-19 is in cytothrombosis due to endothelial perfect. 
How about fungal biomarkers? Let me start with galactomannan. Actually, in my place of practice in the Philippines, we don't have GM available. It's available in Manila, which is in our national capital region. So detection of um, GM in bronchoalveolar lavage fluid is considered to be highly indicative of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. However, it's a different story for detection in blood, where the yield is actually low at best at 20%. There is a low sensitivity in line with published performance of serum GM in non-neutropenic patients in the ICUs, but lower than the 65% sensitivity of serum GM in patients with influenza-associated PA. Overall, serum GM has decreased value for excluding kappa. How about the other biomarker, which is the 1,3-beta-D-glucan? Again, this is a marker that's not available locally here in my practice in Cebu, Philippines. This is a study involving non-COVID cases in the ICU. And in patients with proven or probable IFD or invasive fungal disease or patients with fungal colonization without IFD, there was a recommendation for two consecutive positive test results of the 1,3-beta-D glucan in order to generate a specificity of 90%. So two consecutive results for the serum, beta-D glucan, might increase suspicion of invasive aspergillosis. However, caution in interpretation because this biomarker is not actually specific for aspergillosis and there is a need to exclude other causes for its elevated serum levels. In short, we have diagnostic limitations insofar as CAPA is concerned. We know that there is a decreased use of bronchoscopy procedure, and that is because of the necessity to protect our healthcare workers from aerosol exposures in COVID-19 patients. And we also know the low sensitivity of detection of circulating GM. Detection of aspergillus in specimens of the upper spirit tract, furthermore, often does not distinguish between aspergillus colonization that does not need treatment versus invasive disease. Let me now switch gears to another diagnostic in CAPA, which is the lateral flow assay or device. This is not locally available in our uh, place of practice, but this LFA and LFDs have been used to test blood and bowel. These are the two commercially manufactured LFDs and they require a visual reader for semi-quantitative reading, and the advantage is that it removes the subjectivity when interpreting the results. Performance for IPA detection appears to be optimum when the specimen is bowel. Again, I would like to point out that bronchoscopy procedures are really much less when dealing with COVID-19 patients, and LFA over LFD potentially has superior sensitivity. However, specific data for the diagnosis of CAPA remains scarce. Finally, we have molecular diagnostic through PCR, and the recommendation pre-COVID is two positive results to provide sufficient specificity to confirm an IPA diagnosis. However, performance related to CAPA is yet unknown, but likely similar to those of other non-hematologic populations. This is a table from the ECM ISHAM guidance on diagnostic procedures for the diagnosis of CAPA. And I would like to emphasize on these two specimens which are readily available to us on the ground, which are the tracheal aspirate and sputum respiratory specimens. And we'd like to point out that while they are easy to obtain, they are less representative of the lower respiratory tract compared to bowel and they are often positive in patients with COVID-19 who are critically ill, but they can just represent upper airway colonization. How then do we diagnose CAPA based on the consensus guidance? For tracheobronchitis or other pulmonary form that is proven, we start with the patient setting. So a COVID-19 infected patient that needs intensive care with a temporal relationship, and at least one of the following. Histopath or direct microscopic detection of fungal hyphae showing invasive growth with associated tissue damage, or aspergillus recovered from culture or microscopy or histology, or PCR obtained by a sterile specimen aspiration or biopsy 
from a pulmonary site showing an infectious disease process. Again, this would actually entail invasive procedure. How about probable diagnosis based on the consensus criteria? It has the same entry criterion, but tracheobronchitis is indicated by the presence of ulceration, nodule, pseudomembrane, plaque, or eschar seen on bronchoscopic analysis, and at least one of the following. Microscopic detection of fungal elements in bulk indicating a mold or a positive bulk culture or PCR. Or here we have the use of the biomarker, galactomannan, where the serum index is more than 0.5 or a serum LFA index of more than 0.5 or a BAL GM index of more than 1 or a BAL LFA index of more than 1. And this slide is for probable diagnosis of the other pulmonary forms with the same entry criterion, plus the presence of a pulmonary infiltrate, preferably documented by chest CT, or a cavitating infiltrate not attributed to another cause. I think that this is the common setting that we see with our patients in the hospital. And we have the same microbiologic criteria, plus either equal or more than two aspergillus PCR tests in the blood, or a single positive aspergillus PCR in bowel with less than 36 cycle run on PCR, or a single positive aspergillus PCR in the blood plus a single positive PCR in bowel fluid at any threshold cycle. Finally, how about the diagnosis of only possible pulmonary form of aspergillosis with the same entry criterion we also have the same findings of pulmonary infiltrates and at least one of the following. Microscopic detection of fungal elements, this time in non-bronchoscopic lavage specimen or a positive non-BL culture or the use of biomarkers in non-BL specimens. So I think the key here is that for possible, you were not able actually to obtain bronchoscopic alveolar lavage specimens but still come out with the positive um, cultures or molecular identifications of, or biomarkers of aspergillus. So having discussed the different diagnostic categories for kappa or its other pulmonary forms, we now move on to treatment. This can be divided into azole-sensitive isolates versus azole resistance. For azole-sensitive, which you see on your green block, the first lines of treatment are either voriconazole, and you see the loading dose and subsequent doses on the screen, or isavuconazole with the corresponding doses. In the Philippines, isavuconazole is not yet locally available, but we do have voriconazole both IV and oral. For azol resistant, which you see on the orange block, for suspected, you can do voriconazole plus echinocandine, or substitute vori with isavuconazole plus an echinocandine, but in suspected or proven azole-resistant isolates, there is a preference for liposomal amphotericin B at a dose of 3 mg per kilo per day. Now, the route of administration is preferably IV due to possible malabsorption from gastroparesis in our ICU patients. There is better outcome documented for voriconazole compared to amphotericin B deoxycolate for isavuconazole, there was similar clinical activity to voriconazole with less hepato and neurotoxicity and decreased risk of corrected QT interval prolongation. How about the other antifungals? Let me begin with the echinocandins. They are not recommended for use as monotherapy for IPA. In combination with an azole, which was shown in the blocks earlier, this might have some therapeutic advantage in the critically ill patients in areas of high prevalence of azole resistance. How about posaconazole? It had been documented to have excellent in vitro aspergillus activity, but this has been largely used successfully as salvage treatment in patients without COVID-19. Finally, for itraconazole, there is excellent in vitro aspergillus activity as well, but no robust comparative data versus the established regimens. The next question is, how long then do we treat our patients? The optimal duration is actually unknown, but the expert panel 
suggests 6 to 12 weeks as a treatment course. Radiologic lung imaging might not be a helpful gauge. However, it is reasonable to include a follow-up lung chest CT to document resolution of infiltrates before the decision to terminate treatment. Follow-up respiratory samples for GM testing could also be useful to determine patients who were initially GM positive, and this might also help as to treatment duration. The GM index, however, might be limited by its poor sensitivity when testing in non-neutropenic patients. So in summary, kappa diagnostic categories are possible, probable, and proven based on the ECMM ISHRAM criteria. And the first line of treatment is either voriconazole or isobuconazole with liposomal amphotericin B reserved for isolates with azole resistance. Let me just do a very brief actual case sharing. This is the city picture of a 78-year-old Filipino male whom we managed for IPA. He was hypertensive with coronary artery disease, diabetic, and COPD. And COVID-19 was notably only moderate category from another province and was given only dexamethasone. He first came in for sepsis from a bacterial um, infection, MDR Kleb pneumoniae with complicated paraneumonic effusion for which he underwent CPT, and he in fact later developed Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. The IPA diagnosis was based on the isolation of Aspergillus fumigatus colonies from sputum and later on from ETA when he got intubated, and chest CT scan showed no use. Patient was given a six-week course of voriconazole with good outcome. Let me now switch gears to CAM, COVID-19-associated mucormycosis, with the main reference being the global guideline for the diagnosis and management of mucormycosis from the European Mycology Group. This is a very good illustration of the pathophysiology of mucor, especially its interaction with steroid use and pre-existing diabetes mellitus. COVID-19 per se would actually cause an increase in the cytokines and interleukin-6 that would further increase a hyperferritinic state, and this increase in intracellular free iron would cause an increase in reactive oxygen species. Furthermore, COVID-19, especially in severe cases, would bring about hypoxia in the setting of reduced T-cell um, populations and is also associated with metabolic acidosis. It's also good to mention that endotheliolitis in autopsies are actually seen as a form of endothelial dysfunction in patients who succumb to severe COVID. Add to that the use of corticosteroids plus pre-existing diabetes that cause acute hyperglycemia or new onset hyperglycemia in diabetic patients, pushing sometimes to DKA, and all of these factors would contribute to the development of increased susceptibility to mucor mycosis. This is a very simple but very informative infographic from the WHO as to who are at risk for mucor mycosis in general. In most situations, the fungi actually do not cause harm, but greater risk of infection is seen among diabetics, patients with cancer, patients with HIV AIDS, those who have had treatment with higher or longer doses of steroids, and other weakened immune systems for other reasons. However, there is a note here that many people with COVID-19 have been diagnosed with mucor, although it is not currently known if this is due to COVID-19 or some other reason. Now, the other part of the infographic details how the fungus is spread. They are found throughout the environment, but people with a weakened immune system can develop infection especially in the sinuses and lungs when the fungi enter the airway. In rare cases, skin infection also occurs, especially after a skin injury or trauma. They do not spread from person to person as well. So to recap, host factors are diabetes, underlying malignancies, and our recipients of solid organ or hematopoietic stem cell transplants. As to the etiology, the most commonly reported pathogens in mucor are rhizopus and mucor species and lixemia, which were formerly of genera Absidia and myocladus.
For environmental factors, this is especially important as to the question why there are certain geographic areas like India that have experienced really the onslaught of COVID-19 associated mucormycosis. Of course, it plays a role that if there is a higher environmental burden of fungal spores, this can really be a risk factor for disease even in immunocompetent individuals. There have been previous aeromycological studies from India that found high mean rhizopore score counts. And we do know that it's common in COVID-19 with construction or renovations of new hospital zones and restructuring, and this can potentially result in an outbreak. What then are the clinical manifestations of mucormycosis? In immunocompromised patients, the main route is inhalation of the sporangiospores, and from there, it causes pulmonary mucormycosis. It typically develops in patients with profound neutropenia and graft versus host disease as mentioned previously. However, typically in diabetic patients, it is rhinoorbital disease that is the more common presentation. These are illustrations of rhinoorbital cutaneous manifestations of mucormycosis. In panel B, we have here erythematous skin, ptosis, palpebral edema, and limited ocular motility seen six days um, after symptom onset in uncontrolled diabetes. And then we have in panel C, proptosis, palpebral erythema, also seen in a patient with uncontrolled diabetes. Illustration D would show necrotic, purulent palatal ulcer and cavernous sinus uh, syndrome developed eight days after symptom onset with uncontrolled diabetes. And picture E would show rhino, cerebral, mucormycosis in a two-year-old female with acute um, lymphoblastic leukemia. In immunocompetent patients, the main route, however, is primarily after skin disruption due to trauma, or it can occur also in the setting of burns or surgery, and so cutaneous and soft tissue mucormycosis are the most common forms. Characteristic presentations are abscesses, skin swelling, necrosis, dry ulcers, and scars. Let me turn a little focus on India, where it has been dubbed that mucormycosis was an epidemic within a pandemic, and I would like to allude to this article from Mycosis, where in the demographic comorbidities and COVID-19, vaccination status of the included subjects in this report are shown here on the left side of your screen. There is a predominance of males, and the mean age was 55 years old, and notably the most common comorbidity was diabetes mellitus. As to clinical features, the most common at 100% was nasal congestion with or without discharge, and more than two-thirds presenting with headache. As to sinus involvement, over 95% had pancytosite sinusitis, and 100% had maxillary involvement. This is another report from the EID by Dr. Patel and Dr. Chakrabarty and their team. Both of them are actually members of the AFWG. And this is a good example of being able to map out cases, reportable cases in your country. Now, this um, report was actually between September to December of last year, and 287 mucormycosis cases were captured in 16 health centers in India. Now, this was a twofold increase compared to the same time period in the previous year. And of these, 187 were actually CAM. Although, if you put in the denominators, this was rare at less than 0.3% among hospitalized COVID. Now, the CAM patients had more frequent hypoxia, which required ICU admission. However, there were similar manifestations and outcomes between CAM and non-CAM cases, and majority still had uncontrolled diabetes as a risk factor. Most CAM cases were given glucocorticoids as part of their COVID treatment, and it is possible that the steroids contributed as an added risk factor to these CAM cases. However, the research gap is that larger samples to look into um, the factors for CAM would have to be looked into. The next few slides will show to you the algorithms for the diagnostic workup and management of patients with suspected or confirmed mucormycosis based from the 
European uh, mycology group. So, for example, if mucormycosis is suspected or confirmed in a diabetic presenting with facial pain, sinusitis, or proptosis, there is recommendation to do a cranial CT where the typical finding is bone destruction or a cranial MRI where the typical finding is involvement of the orbits with or without brain involvement. For example, in Asia, specifically in India, these are the risk factors. And so abdominal CT or MRI is recommended because typical finding of an isolated abdominal mass may be seen. Through these imagings, it is then possible to do staging of the involvement of mucormycosis. One of the radiologic findings that you will hear about mucormycosis is the so-called reversed or inverse halo sign or atoll sign. And as pointed in the arrows, these are ground glass opacity areas that are surrounded by a ring of consolidation. So moving forward with the algorithm after staging is done, then sampling is preferably done through biopsy, although this entails invasive procedures. And again, we know that's a limitation for COVID-19. Or one can do serology through our biomarkers. So these are the options for which we can clinch the diagnosis of mucormycosis. We now move on to the management algorithm. Again, as I've mentioned, from the European Mycology Group and also a uh, reminder that the green boxes are strongly recommended, the yellow boxes are moderately recommended, the peach or orange boxes are marginally recommended, and the pink with recommendation against. So for suspected or confirmed mucormycosis, surgical debridement with clear margins where applicable is necessary, plus immediate treatment um, initiation. So if we look into our armamentarium of antifungals, we have here isavuconazole, and posaconazole, as well as liposomal amphotericin B. Avoid amphotericin B deoxycolate due to toxicity issues, although in our um, country, in the Philippines, this is still being used because of cost issues. The liposomal or the lipid forms are actually way more expensive than the conventional forms. And then there is a reminder to avoid slow escalation of doses and Go ahead with the recommended dosages depending on the patient population. Of course, just as important is monitoring treatment response. And this um, algorithm would further summarize how to go about it. I would actually just like to point out that therapeutic drug monitoring or TDM is not available everywhere. In fact, in the Philippines, we don't actually have um, the capacity to do TDM. So in summary for CAM, the COVID-19 patient is usually the severely ill who is admitted at the ICU, mechanically ventilated, and chronically hospitalized. The most common risk factors are diabetes, steroid use, solid organ transplant patients, and those patients with hematopoietic malignancies. Our armamentarium for diagnostics include direct microscopy and histopathology with the use of special stains as well as culture and if available, molecular identification. First line of treatment are the lipid formulations of amphotericin B, as well as posaconazole, which comes as an oral suspension, and where applicable, the need for surgical debridement. So CAM is definitely preventable with good glycemic control, especially during COVID-19. So there should be rational use of systemic glucocorticoids as well, with plasma glucose monitoring, we know that the recommended duration is only 5 to 10 days, and if dexamethasone is used, recommended at 6 mg daily. Universal masking to reduce exposure to mucoralis and avoidance of construction sites. And just as important is education. During discharge, patients should be advised about early symptoms of possible mucormycosis, such as facial pain, nasal blockage or discharge, cough, chest pain, and hemoptysis. I'm in my last leg of the lecture, and this will now cover COVID-associated candidiasis. Let me allude to this report on CAC among severe COVID patients since this was one of the first to have collated data on such. This was an observation prospective study in Spain early last year, and the prevalence of systemic candidiasis was reported at 14.4% 
the most common species of which were albicans and parapsilosis. Among those with candida species growth in comparison with the negative group, these are highlighted in red. These candida species positive patients had greater severity of pneumonia. They had higher degree of radiologic involvement and they had greater extent of lung injury. They stayed longer in the ICU and they had higher mortality rates. Candida species isolates were found in patients that were submitted to tocilizumab with or without steroids and at that time with the use of lopinavir, ritonavir, as well as interferon type 1 beta. What is significant here is the possibility that tocilizumab with or without steroids may predispose the patients to CAC. The CAC risk factors can be grouped into two. First are the common risk factors that predispose ICU patients to invasive candidiasis. And the list here is very common to all of us, such as diabetes, um, chronic dialysis patients, those undergoing abdominal surgery, the presence of central lines, the use of parenteral nutrition, receipt of multiple antibiotics, and longer stay in the ICU. However, there are also risk factors that are really specific to COVID-19. And among these would be, since they are in ARDS, so ECMO may be used, and we know that ECMO is associated with really a high number of central lines. Second, the use of steroids. And we know that steroids have immunosuppressive effects on our neutrophils, monocytes, and macrophages. However, it is largely unknown yet if severe lung epithelium damage exerted by the virus would cause the candida adherence to the basement membrane that would subsequently lead to invasive candidiasis. There are also diagnostic challenges with being able to pin down or clinch the diagnosis of CEC. Number one is the low number of yeast cells in circulation or in the infected tissue. Second is the requirement, once again, for invasive procedures to diagnose deep-seated candidiasis. And third would be the use of non-fungal specific media in culture or to culture isolate clinical samples. The gold standard remains culture. However, we know that only half of these can be identified by blood culture for candidemia. There are non-culture diagnoses such as our beta D glucan and manan antigen testing. And also, we have the advancement in technology with molecular platforms such as PCR and the T2 Candida panel. So, combining these multiple techniques is recommended in order to increase the diagnostic yield. Just a slide to focus on Candida auris since this is the first fungal pathogen considered a global health threat. In fact, this has been reported worldwide in more than 35 countries with four different clades emerging spontaneously in different areas around the world. And these are the major characteristics that make it really a public health threat. They are notoriously multidrug resistant. They are difficult to identify with traditional methods in laboratories, so the diagnosis may be missed. And they are associated with nosocomial infections, notably healthcare outbreaks. They spread from person to person, and that is why there should be stringent infection control if there is suspicion or confirmation of candida auris in the specific unit of the hospital. And this, in fact, differs from other candida species, wherein usually the candida comes from one's own microbiome. For candida auris, however, as mentioned, it is largely nosocomia. And even though they share the same virulence factors with the other candida species, Auris can evade innate immunity and can form biofilms that make them, make them resistant to antifungal agents. So the occurrence can range from colonization to invasive disease and candidemia, and notably there is really a very high mortality rate reaching 68%. The achinocandines are looked at as possible treatment options for this notorious fungal bug. So how do we manage CAC? It is similar to that for non-COVID patients. We need timely recognition and prompt initiation of appropriate therapy wherein the treatment of choice are our echinocandines. However, source control when feasible is very important, especially removal of central lines if it is central line um, related. But the research gaps abound as to the timely development of predictive scores or diagnostic tests 
with high positive and or negative predictive values to aid in a more prompt diagnosis. Finally, this is a slide that would look into the antifungal armamentarium in the future. I'm not even sure how to pronounce all of these. We have Ibrexa fungerp, which is a new class of structurally distinct glucan synthase inhibitor in phase 3 trials with excellent oral bioavailability. And then we are looking at a new generation echinocandine, such as Reza fungin, which can be given once weekly and with favorable penetration in intra-abdominal candidiasis, which is a limitation to the currently available echinocandines. And we have Phosmanogepix, the novel mechanism of which is inhibition of a highly conserved fungal enzyme, GWT1. I am finally down to my summary slide. First of all, the full extent and true burden of IFI amidst this pandemic is not really known, and the current data that we know are likely an underestimate of these IFIs, be it CAPA, CAM, or CAC. The above is due to challenges in IFI recognition based on overlapping and nonspecific clinical manifestations and major diagnostic limitations. Looking forward, however, we can still do vigilant clinical monitoring, especially if there is worsening of symptoms in patients with severe COVID-19 and patient risk factors. These are necessary triggers for early workup and subsequent prompt initiation of appropriate antifungal therapy as we await further advances in both diagnostics and therapeutics. And to formally close, this pandemic has brought about a lot of life lessons, and let me quote Martin Luther King Jr. in saying that we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. Thank you very much for listening.